It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. CBS News Correspondents Larry LeSeur and Bill Costello. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Mike Mansfield, United States Senator from Montana. Sometimes it seems as though the Republican Party is Pacific-minded, whereas the Democratic Party, at least when it was in power, was and is European-minded. But the voice of our guest tonight is just to be beginning to be heard on the subject of the Pacific. Senator Mansfield is the leading Democratic expert on the Pacific on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Senator Mansfield, I recall that you served as a Marine as a young man in China, and now that you're on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, do you feel that the policy of the United States is a bipartisan one in regard to the Pacific? Uh, Larry, I, uh, I certainly do. I think, as a matter of fact, that the President feels more at ease, more at home, has shown more courage and more patience since the election last November, and the Democrats took over than he uh, did before. I think he has gotten away from his desire to try and get along with the extreme right wing of his party. And in the person of Senator George, a great American, as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, he feels more confidence and he is showing the traits of leadership which the American people thought he, thought he had when they elected him two years ago. Well, does this mean that you're satisfied with our foreign policy as it, uh, it points towards the uh, Formosan Straits in Southeast Asia? Yes, uh, I am satisfied with the policy of late, though I must admit that I certainly was not satisfied with it uh, in the beginning. I didn't like the idea of the president saying on January the 20th, 1953, that uh, the Seventh Fleet was being withdrawn from the Straits of Formosa, where it was protecting the Chinese communists on the mainland. I'm delighted that uh, tonight, uh, Secretary Dulles did uh, give President Truman credit for stationing the fleet uh, in the Formosa Straits for the purpose of protecting uh, Chong on Formosa itself. I think that we made mistakes uh, at uh, Geneva and elsewhere, but within the past uh, eight, nine months, uh, the foreign policy of this administ administration has been sound, and I think it's been carried out on a good bipartisan basis. Well, Senator Mansfield, do you think that the administration is on solid ground in estimating communist intentions in Asia as a basis for policy? Do you, that is, do you think that they regard their uh, Chinese intentions as for peace or for war? Bill, it's a hard question to answer, but I think that uh, Eisenhower is a man of peace fundamentally. I believe him when he says that there is no alternative to peace. I think he is taking a calculated risk, and that in his mind, uh, there is a good possibility that peace may be achieved uh, through the Formosa Resolution, uh, through the treaty with Chiang Kai-shek, and through the policy which he has pursued with the help of uh, the United Nations. Well, will the Reds meet him halfway? Uh, that remains to be seen. If they do not, of course, uh, that means war. And uh, if it means war, it might mean more than war on the China mainland for us because we have the uh, Sino-Soviet Treaty of 1950, which you know uh, has been emphasized very much in the past three weeks. And uh, we have other complications to think of, such as the resumption of the war in Korea and the stepping up of activities in Indochina. Well, Senator, do you think that, uh, do you agree with Senator Humphrey that we should clear up the mystery on whether we're going to defend those coastal islands which are near to the Chinese mainland which I believe are the largest ones, Matsu and Kimoi? Not at this time. I think that uh, we have to place a certain amount of trust in Mr. Dulles and President Eisenhower, and uh, as long as they have all the powers which have been delegated to them uh, under the resolution and the treaty with uh, Formosa, or rather with the uh, Nationalist China, uh, I think we ought to allow them a little bit in the way of leeway and let them exercise their best judgment so that, if possible, some degree of stabilization can be achieved in the uh, far eastern area and uh, some settlement uh, which they think worthwhile can be brought about. Well, since uh, John Kaishek has put one-third of his combat forces on those small islands along the coast, uh, how could uh, the United States uh, fail to defend them? Well, it would depend. If uh, the resolution which the New Zealanders have offered in the United Nations is finally accepted, I don't believe the door has been shut on it entirely, uh, then, of course, it may be that in the minds of the administration there's some intangible, such as a quid pro quo by means of which uh, Chong would uh, perhaps uh, withdraw from the uh, 
uh, some of the offshore islands anyway, in that way ensuring the security and the defense of the Pescadores and Formosa. If, however, the Chinese Reds launch an attack against Kimoy, Matsu, and the other uh, offshore groups, uh, which uh, we would deem to be in preparation for an attack on the Pescadores and Formosa, uh, then it would be war and no question about it. Well, uh, Senator, do you consider Formosa as a geographic entity absolutely vital to the security of this country in the Pacific? Or is it vital as a, I, take, I trust you think it's vital, is it vital as a symbol of a, of a people who have fought against communism on our side and lost? Uh, the answer to both questions would be that uh, I do think that it is a part of our island defense chain extending from the Aleutians uh, down through Japan, uh, Okinawa, uh, Formosa to the Philippines and from there to Southeast Asia and to the Southwest Pacific. I think it's also a symbol of a people who have held out against the communist menace uh, for many years. And I think that uh, as long as we are bound uh, to a disposition, a final disposition of Formosa, that uh, we are bound also under the terms of the treaty which we've just concluded with the nationalist government to protect it. After all, no one uh, really owns Formosa at the present time. It is the property of the victorious allies. There has been no conveyance of deed or title and uh, until its uh, final status is settled, then I think we do have to protect it. I do think it's vital in the American uh, chain of defense, the barrier island, the island barrier, extending along that part of the Pacific. Well, Senator Mansfield, speaking of this island chain, do you think we have enough reliable allies in Asia to defend that uh, line or any other? No, I do not, Bill. I think we have reliable allies in, uh, in, uh, in South Korea, a good-sized army of 600,000 uh, there. Uh, we haven't got uh, much of an army uh, in the Japanese Empire at the present time, though I understand that, uh, that uh, prospects are that it will increase gradually. Uh, we have a fair-sized army in the Philippines, probably 50,000, 54,000 Filipinos. And then you have uh, Chong, with something like 600,000 troops, of which I understand probably 300,000 can be considered as effectives. In Southeast Asia, we haven't got a great deal. The French have something like 140,000 men left in Indochina. The native Vietnamese army uh, doesn't amount to a great deal as yet, though I imagine that its training will be stepped up very shortly and its effectiveness become more pronounced. Cambodia and Laos have, haven't much in the way of armed forces. And then uh, from there, you have to go all the way down to Australia and New Zealand, where I understand the Australians have something like 100,000 and the New Zealanders something like 50,000 men. Uh, we have lots of friends, but uh, nothing much in the way of strong allies in that part of the world. Senator Mansfield, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier, if I may. You said that uh, something about clearing up the future status of Formosa. Does that mean that uh, you think it's possible to envisage a situation in which uh, there would be two Chinas, or at least a republic of Formosa and a mainland China? Well, uh, that is a possibility. No one can tell what will happen until the final status the deed of conveyance, so to speak, has been uh, drawn up as far as Formosa and the Pescadores uh, uh, are, are concerned. However, I would say that this government, in, uh, seeking the United, in seeking the help of the United Nations to bring about a ceasefire in the Straits of Formosa, uh, by that fact, uh, has indeed accorded a further uh, degree of recognition to Communist China and has implied, at least, that there are two Chinas, because if the UN is going to carry on, ca is going to carry on negotiations, naturally those negotiations will be, will be between uh, Red China on the one hand and Nationalist China on the other. Uh, as a Democrat, do you think you could have done this if, the, if, if a Democratic administration were in power? Do you think you could have made this move without bringing the wrath of the right-wing Republicans down on your head? Uh, not at all, uh, Larry, and I will say that a lot of the right-wing right Republicans are not too happy about their own administration stand in this matter. But had a Democrat been in there, well, the House would have been set on fire. Senator, I'd like, if I may, just to sh shift for a moment to uh, Southeast Asia. You were down there last fall, just uh, after we uh, saw each other in Manila, uh, and you visited uh, South Vietnam. What do you think has to be done or can be done to save South Vietnam from communism? Uh, Bill, uh, we can't afford to allow South Vietnam to go by default. The only thing we can do, as was recommended last September, is to give our full support to Joe Dinh Diem, the present premier, who has been struggling under tremendous difficulties to bring about order out of chaos and to bring some degree of uh, real independence to uh, the uh, state of uh, South Vietnam. 
Uh, he has had to overcome the obstinacy of Bao Dai. He's had to break down the army under General Hid. He's had to combat the sex, but this man who has great integrity, who is honest, and who has a real sense of duty, is at last beginning to show that he has the necessary wherewithal by means of which the people of South Vietnam can be welded together into a national unit, and I think our policy is paying off. Senator Mansfield, when we uh, made this congressional resolution and also went to the United Nations with a uh, resolution to neutralize those offshore islands, it seemed to me that we confronted the Chinese communists with a pair of aces, but they didn't seem to be impressed, and they apparently raised the bid a bit. Now, am I mistaking this game? Is there a showdown coming now, or is this, with your familiarity with negotiation, is this a bargaining period? Well, I would say that this is the bargaining period. Uh, no one should expect the Chinese communists uh, to say yes or no uh, just as soon as a proposition is advanced to them, such as the New Zealand resolution. However, uh, while they turned down the New Zealand resolution, they did say that they would uh, consider the Russian resolution if they were given a seat on the Security Council. Well, uh, both of those are out of the question, absolutely. But it does indicate that as far as the communists are concerned, that they have not shut the door completely and that they are open for more bargaining. After all, as Bill Costello knows far better than I, uh, the Chinese are great at bargaining. And uh, I would look forward to some weeks of uh, uh, tossing the ball back and forth before a final decision or settlement is arrived at. Well, thank you very much, Senator Mansfield. It was a great pleasure to hear from you tonight. Pleasure, Bill. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Bill Costello, our distinguished guests was the Honorable Mike Mansfield, United States Senator from Montana. Longines is the world's most honored watch, and by any standard of comparison, Longines is ranked as the highest achievement in modern watchmaking. The greater your discrimination, the greater will be your appreciation of the quality, the beauty, and the unsurpassed performance of a Longines watch. Now here are the facts. Among the finest watches of the world, only Longines has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes. 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy at the great government observatories. Yet, in spite of surpassing quality, you may buy a 14 karat gold Longines watch for about $100 or even less. A gold filled watch for as little as $70,150. You may choose from the largest variety of styles and types of any watchmaker in the whole world. Quality considered, a Longines watch represents the highest value in all watchmaking. And may we say that if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, in fairness to yourself, insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Help your heart fund, help your heart.